If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question before listening on. Our first step would be to draw the forces that are acting on the cubicle box. At the center of the box, we have the weight force acting downward. We have the applied force that's trying to push or roll the box forward. Where the box and surface are contacting each other, there's going to be two forces. There's the frictional force that's opposing the applied pushing force, and then the normal force of the ground is pushing up on the box. Notice that the normal force and that frictional force are acting at this corner right here, because as the box just begins to roll, the only part of the box that is touching the surface is located at this point. There is no other contact between the box and the surface along this line right here. Only at that corner will they still be touching as the box begins to roll forward. And what we'll do is actually choose this corner point as our pivot and apply the sum of the torques is equal to zero equation. Now we know that the sum of the torques is equal to zero because the box is not accelerating in an angular motion or in an angular fashion as it's being tipped over. It's just being tipped over at a nice constant speed. So the sum of the torques would indeed equal zero. We'll notice that there are two forces passing through the pivot point. There is the normal force and the frictional force. Because those two forces are passing through the pivot, their torques will be zero. So we can actually disregard them in the torque equation. We could turn to the applied force F and determine its torque. When calculating torque, we multiply the force times some distance. Now for that distance, what we need to do is find a perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot. So for example, if we take this force and just imagine extending it horizontally in this fashion, and then we look at the pivot over here, a perpendicular distance from the pivot to that force would simply be the length of the side of the box. So when we plug in for the distance right here, all we have to do is use L, which again represents the length of the box. It's also worth noting that the applied force as it's pushing the box at the top is attempting to rotate the box in a clockwise fashion. And clockwise rotation or clockwise torque is considered to be negative. So we would have to include a negative sign here. Now the weight force is also applying a torque. And so we're gonna to have to add that into the torque equation. Once again, we're going to need a perpendicular distance between that force and the pivot. And we can see that perpendicular distance would be this line right here, which is simply half of the length of the box. And the torque applied by the weight can remain positive because we can see from the diagram that as the weight pulls down on the box, it's tending to cause the box to rotate in an anti-clockwise fashion about this pivot. And anti-clockwise or counterclockwise is considered to be positive torque. At this point, we could set the torque equation equal to zero. Now our goal is to solve for the force in part A, so why don't we go ahead and add the term FL over to the right hand side. And then you'll notice that L appears on both the right and left hand side of the equation, so if we divide both sides of the equation by L, they will cancel out. Notice that we would be left with one half right here. And so at this point we could simply plug in the known weight of 890 newtons and this will allow us to determine the minimum force required to tip this box over. And so when we compute that, we get 445 newtons. So this would be the correct answer to part A. To solve part B, we return back to our free body diagram of this cubicle box, and what we'll do is concentrate on the two forces that are acting in the horizontal or x direction. Again, since the box is not accelerating, we know that the sum of the forces in the x direction must equal zero. There are two forces. There is the applied force F and then the frictional force, which is pointing to the left. So we'll call it minus F and we can set that equal to zero. Now it's worth remembering that the frictional force, which is lowercase f, is represented by the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force. And so we can solve this equation for mu sub s, which is the coefficient of static friction that part B is asking for. We can subtract uppercase F over to the right hand side and then divide both sides of the equation by negative Fn. So we can see that mu s is going to be the force F 
divided by the normal force. We figured out the force F in part A of the question. The normal force can be computed by looking at the sum of the forces in the y direction, which is also equal to zero, again, because the box is not accelerating. So essentially, we have the normal force pointing upward. We have the downward weight force, so that'll be minus W. We can set that equal to zero. If we just add W over to the right-hand side, we can see that the normal force is indeed equal to W which was 890 newtons. So we can plug in 890 newtons for the normal force here, and then the 445 newtons we found earlier for this force here. And when we simplify that, we get 0 0.50. So this is the correct answer to part B of the question. Now onto part C. It turns out that we can apply a smaller force to this upper left edge of the box in order to get it to rotate if we apply that force at an angle relative to the horizontal. Now as that applied force pushes up on the left side of the box here, the box is going to rotate once again about this point. So we're going to choose this as our pivot. The normal force and the frictional force once again will be excluded from the torque equation since they pass through the pivot. What we'll do is we'll break this force into both its y and x component. Now we can see that the y component is opposite of the angle theta, so we could denote that as f sine of theta. And then the x component is adjacent to the angle, so we can denote that as f cosine of theta. And then we're going to be working strictly with the components, so if you wish, you can sort of ignore this resultant force marked f. Now let's look at the torque applied by f cosine of theta. Remember with torque, we take the force we multiply it by a distance, and that has to be a perpendicular distance to the pivot. So if we once again imagine that we extend the line of f cosine theta and then draw a distance from the pivot so that it's perpendicular to that extended force line, we can see that that length has to be the length of the cubicle box. That applied force would be tending to rotate the box in a clockwise fashion about the pivot point that we have selected, so we'll make that a negative torque. On to the f sine theta force, we can actually just slide it over to the left corner right here. And we can see that if we extended that force, then a perpendicular distance from the pivot would once again be the entire length of the box. So when we plug into the torque equation, we can simply say f sine of theta times that distance l. Notice that torque is negative as well because that f sine theta force as it's pushing up on the box is tending to cause the box to rotate again in a clockwise fashion. And then we have the torque applied by the weight force. Now we already established earlier that that's going to be positive torque and that force would be multiplied by L divided by 2. We can set this equation equal to 0. And then what we want to do is solve the equation for the force F, which is what we're looking for. So let's subtract the WL over 2 to the right. We can then divide each term by negative 1. We could also divide each term by L so that the L's cancel. We'll factor out an F. And then we'll divide both sides by the term cos theta plus sine theta. Now, in order to make this force as small as possible, we actually need the denominator to be as large as possible. And in order to do that, we would frankly need to maximize the cosine of theta plus sine of theta. So if we can find a theta value that maximizes cos theta plus sine theta, that will cause this denominator to be as large as possible. And when that denominator is as large as possible, that's going to make the force as small as possible since we're dividing by that denominator. And so we need to maximize cos theta plus sine theta. Perhaps to make it a function, we could just set it equal to y. We'll have to take the derivative. So the derivative of cos theta, of course, is negative sine theta. And then the derivative of sine theta is cos theta. We'll set that derivative equal to 0. We'll add the sine theta over to the other side. And we can see that we have cos theta equal to sine theta. Now the only value of theta that's going to satisfy this equation would be 45 degrees. We know that because the cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2 and the sine of 45 is also root 2 over 2. So this would be the theta that would cause this function to be a maximum value. Now that we have that theta, we can go back and plug it into our force equation.
And when we crunch that down, we get approximately 315 newtons. And that is the correct answer to part C. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, click the thumbs up icon and subscribe. Remember, you can send in your own question to the email address on the screen, and I'll do my best to post an answer to it on YouTube.